Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the enormous privilege of serving as president of Hunter College, where for a century and a half, the American dream has always come true. At Hunter, caring for the future is not only our college's motto, but our college's mission as well. Towards that goal, it is a pleasure to welcome you back online this evening for the second in a new program series entitled Speaking of Justice, Race, Racism, and Reform. This series was born out of our shared commitment to explore fresh ways to confront and end systemic racism and expand opportunity at Hunter College and beyond. We got off to an exemplary start last Thursday with a panel on the history of protest movements, exploring how that legacy impacts the current nationwide demonstrations in support of long promised, long delayed equality. It was truly extraordinary to present three of our top Hunter faculty professors, Dr. De Weston Haywood, Dr. Lazara Lima, and Dr. Calvin John Smiley, with also joined by an amazing Black Lives Matter activist, Shavona Newsom, to explore both the tradition of protest and the reality of current movements for change. Of course, all of us miss being on campus to share and be in person with civic engagement and all of us look forward to the day when we're able again to welcome experts, authors, members of the family, and the country community at large to learn together as we have for so long. But this online series is surely the next best thing to being there, and we are excited to learn more about today's topic, Down With Monuments and Symbols. We present it at a time when Americans are seriously re-examining our history our long-standing traditions, and our selective use of national memory. This is especially the case when it comes to symbols and statues that have for so long memorialized both our shared and our divided past. In the last month alone, we have seen the Confederate stars and bars removed at last from the flag of the last southern state to cling to it. And in the former Confederacy, we have seen statues taken down and sometimes toppled as both governments and demonstrators demand a new reckoning about the historic figures long placed on pedestals. Do such symbols represent heritage or hostility? And it's a fraught issue and not just a regional one. Roosevelt House director Harold Holzer, a historian, who has written about icons and iconoclasm for 40 years, recently pointed out that those controversial statues of Lee and Jackson in Richmond were funded by the sale of pictures made right here in New York. Clearly, we're all in this moment of cultural reassessment together. I want to thank Harold Holzer, who is also our Jonathan Fatten Director of Roosevelt House, along with John Rose, our Dean of Diversity, and Misha Smith and Malky Schwartz from Hunter College for their work conceiving and producing this important series. Tonight's discussion will be led by Hunter's own Karen Hunter, distinguished lecturer in the Department of Film and Media, and the host of the popular Sirius XM radio show, The Karen Hunter Show. She is also a best-selling author and a journalist whose honors include a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. In June 2015, Karen authored a petition calling for the removal of the Confederate flag from the State House of South Carolina in the wake of the massacre of nine people at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Within three days, more than 500,000 people signed that petition. Within a week, Governor Nikki Haley vowed to take down the flag, and within two weeks, the flag was removed. This is one example of the power and reach of the Karen Hunter Show. As Karen often says, the Karen Hunter Show is not a talk show, it's an action show. Karen, thank you for bringing your thought-provoking and cutting-edge programming to Hunter tonight, for leading this important discussion, and for inspiring our students inside and outside the classroom. Joining Karen, we are honored to welcome Representative Zakia Summers, a distinguished member of the Mississippi State Legislature. 
She previously served with the state ACLU as an executive in broadcast journalism and as a county elections commissioner. We feel especially close kinship with Sakia since not long ago, Hunter's Grove scholars enjoyed the rewarding chance to meet and chat with her during an, an unforgettable human rights field trip they took to Mississippi. Representative Summers, thank you so much for finding the time in your busy schedule to be with us today and also for connecting with our students. You are truly a member of our Hunter community. Finally, we are delighted to welcome back to Hunter College and to Roosevelt House, Brent Legs, the founding director of the African American Cultural Action Fund and an architectural historian at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He has worked to save African-American heritage landmarks like Madam C.J. Walker's estate in Irvington, New York, and Nina Simone's birthplace in Tryon, North Carolina. It's a pleasure to have this key figure in the black preservation movement with us tonight and as a part of our Roosevelt House family. Thank you. So now please welcome, join me in welcoming this distinguished panel and Karen Hunter, we thank you for moderating and all you do for our Hunter College community. You are a treasure. Welcome Professor Karen Hunter and our distinguished guests. Thank you so much, President Rob. I appreciate you and I wanna just thank all of the folk that helped put this together at Roosevelt House. Uh, the series is called Speaking of Justice, Race, Racism and Reform. And tonight's program, Down with Monuments and Symbols. As President Rob just mentioned, uh, in 2015, it was June 17th, I'll never forget the night, a white nationalist sat in a Wednesday night Bible study with some beautiful people at Mother Emanuel Baptist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. He stayed there for more than two hours before he opened fire, murdering nine people. I couldn't sleep that night. And when I got up the next day, weary, I decided I was gonna call Nikki Haley, even though I didn't know her, and demand that the Confederate flag come down from the state house because all I could think was those nine funeral processions, including Senator, state legislator, Clemente Pinckney, going by a Confederate flag and how not just ironic, but despicable that image would be. So I wrote a couple of paragraphs, hit send, and in three days, 577,000 people signed a petition. Bree Newsom went up that flagpole and she snatched the flag down during that period of time before the flag actually was legislatively removed. But today we ask the question, was that symbolic change one that actually led to any salvageable conclusion or solution to this racial pandemic that we're currently in? Joining me, the panel to discuss this of course, Mr. Brent Legs, and I wanna start with Representative Zakia Summers, who a couple of weeks ago was a member of a legislative branch that also voted to take down a rebel flag from her state, her state's um, flag. Welcome to the, to the program, you two. Uh, Zakia, what was that process? Talk a little bit about the conversations that went on, uh, I'm sure on Zoom at this point, <laughs> Uh, around actually removing that flag that was embedded into the Mississippi state flag. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you to Hunter College and to President Rob. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Malky, who's a professor there. Just thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, you know, what we were able to do here in Mississippi is absolutely incredible. You know, no one would have ever thought that in 2020, in the state of Mississippi that we would take down our flag and remove that that emblem and it, and it really um, came about because of you know what the nation was dealing with in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and um, you know living in a global pandemic where people are sitting at home you know watching TV glued to the television listening to uh, journalists talk about this issue and you know having having much more time on their hands to be able to act and we were um, we were on a temporary recess when George Floyd happened 
um, but were called back to the Capitol about two months later. And the, the conversation really started with a couple of representatives saying, you know, um, today would be a great day to take down the Mississippi flag, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, let's talk about it. And it was actually a white woman, Republican, um, from Forest County who said that to um, a black male uh, Democrat legislator from Hines County. And from there, um, they started conversations with a couple of my classmates. So I, I would like to say, you know, my freshman class was able to, to really make a historical mark this year um, in the session. And, you know, from there, um, you know, people got a hold of, of it and it, and it just kind of took off like wildfire. Uh, we saw protests happening here in Jackson and across the state as a result of George Floyd. And I think the, um, the, the goal of that was to, you know, how can we take down the flag, but also how can we elevate some of these issues that are impacting um, communities of, of color, particularly black people in the state of Mississippi. Front legs, your legacy is preservation. Yes. Symbols and monuments. How, you know, as I, as I re-examine where we are right now in this nation, I wonder, taking down the flag in South Carolina, taking down the flag in Mississippi, what impact does that have? Because as I look back five years, there's still racial disharmony in South Carolina. As a matter of fact, there have been several police brutality cases since those nine beautiful people lost their lives in that horrific gun, you know, being gunned down in, at Mother Emanuel. What, what, what's going to come of this? Well, listening to yours and Representative Summer's story, I was sitting here thinking to myself, I had no idea that the program that I lead, the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, is a part of this activism on behalf of justice. So when Mother Emanuel happened, we were thinking it's clear that culture, heritage, and public spaces collided in the most violent way, and that the symbols of hate influence the mind of a man that would go to a sacred space and to create that kind of tragedy. That tragedy happened at a historic sacred space. Charlottesville in 2017, white men in polo shirts and khaki pants would rally around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture because of that embedded ideology of white supremacy and white nationalism and would use heritage and public space and art as an act for creating a new Jim Crow. So we knew that we needed to provide national leadership and that we could demonstrate that historic preservation, or as I like to say, cultural preservation, could respond to a social crisis. Thus, the Action Fund was born, $25 million campaign to support the preservation of 150 Black history sites in the United States. And our goal is to use Black history, Americans' origin story, to reconstruct our national identity. What do you both say to people who say, we're rewriting history? You know, uh, Nikki Haley, before she was forced to take down that flag, said the flag is fine, it's heritage, it's Southern heritage. The president of the United States just this week said that this is freedom of speech to have these flags and monuments and statues up. Zakia, what do you say to that? Well, you know, I, and, and it's interesting because I was just on a call before we had this with uh, my colleague in South Carolina, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter, and we were talking about the history that they were able to make five years ago in the aftermath of the church shooting and the history that we've been able to make here in Mississippi. And she said, you know, now we're five years later and I really can't attest to any forward movement in terms of, you know, um, how we combat systemic racism in, in policy. And I tell you, I don't want to be here five years later in Mississippi saying the same thing. Um, and, and we heard the argument about, you know, this is our heritage, this is, this is our history. 
And we said, look, you know, we're not saying that, you know, by removing the state flag, you can't fly it at your house. Fly it at your house so that we know what houses to stay away from. You can certainly talk about your heritage and your history to your folks. But this is also, you know, we, we knew that when we took down the flag that it was a battle won, but it was not a war won. We still have much more work to do. And we understood that taking down the flag was, yes, a, a move in the right direction, but it, it, doesn't, do, it doesn't do the due justice that's needed to combat uh, white privilege and white supremacy. And that we still have to continue to speak truth to power when we're talking about how that plays within policy um, and how that plays out in, in our communities. I often wonder how, how a person could live in Mississippi and look at that flag or how a person could live in South Carolina as a black person. You know, you talk about Mississippi, we're talking Mega Evers, we're talking about Viola Luozo, we're talking Goodman, Cheney and Schwerner and, and the history, the legacy of the, the murder and, and lynchings that happened in, under that flying flag and that every day you just walk by it, you know, but it took eight minutes and 46 seconds of a knee on a man's neck in Minneapolis for folks to have the appetite to change. That to me is strange. Uh, yeah. But Brent, please, please, you know, speak to that. Well, I actually think change has been happening incrementally over time. And, and the conversation by Confederate monuments isn't necessarily new, but that knee on the neck shifted national consciousness in a way that we have not seen for a generation. And, and we are beginning to have an honest conversation about the Confederate flag, the statues, the, the monuments, because in essence, they have stood in public spaces and evoked trauma on African Americans that have to interact with that space. That's not how we treat American citizens. That is not our nation living up to its just and best self. And most importantly, those monuments were created to rewrite history. They are a false construct. White supremacy is not real. It was a way to glorify the lost cause in many ways and to use art as a form of psychological warfare against African Americans all across our nation. That's why a broad multiracial coalition is advocating for their removal. And so I, I'm mindful of if we remove them from public space, what do we replace in the prominence of that public space? And I hope that we begin to have conversations about elevating and recognizing the full contributions of Black America to this nation. And I want to see new forms of monuments in our civic space that tells the story of African American women in American history, that continues to honor all of the other African American stories. We have an opportunity to create an inclusive American landscape, and I think the moment is now. Mm. Karen, and, and if yeah, you no, might, let, let me add, I, I just wanted to add some kind of a personal testimony to, to the flag. Um, you know, I've, I've been a Mississippian all of my life, and I, I guess I really didn't begin to appreciate uh, the flag until I began working side by side with the NAACP. I was responsible for uh, coordinating the state conventions. And we had um, a longtime member who's been an advocate and activist for a number of years uh, tell me, and she wanted me to make sure that wherever we had this, the state convention, that that venue did not fly the flag. And, you know, that, that has always stayed with me. And, and since then, now I, I, before, you know, a couple weeks ago, walk into spaces and go into cities and towns looking to see, you know, where the flag is. I can remember when my family and I, this was shortly after Charlottesville, we were driving home from the coast and we stopped at a gas station at some small town. And there was a truck, truck that pulled up next to us and they had Confederate flags wrapped around their truck. And the song that they were playing was, uh, the South will rise again. 
And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, that was really the first time that I felt real fear and real anxiety about seeing that, seeing that symbol, you know, people have been talking about it all along and I was aware of what it meant, but actually seeing it in that way and hearing the song, it, it brought fear. And then another situation happened just last year when I was campaigning for this position, uh, my husband and I, my family, we were out at a church in my district and we were out, you know, campaigning because we want to go to where the voters were. And this church, this particular church um, was in uh, South Hines County. It was a majority Republican area, but I knew that when I was elected, I was going to represent everybody, you know, no matter what party you are or color or whatever. And so I told my husband, I said, well, you go put the campaign cards on the cars and I'll go talk to the people. So we made a deal. Cool. So he goes to put the cards on the cars and he comes back in like less than four minutes. And I'm like, wow, that's a new record of, of campaigning. And he said, no, Z, he said, I, I can't do it. I said, why? He said, because all of these cars have, have Confederate tags on them. And I don't feel comfortable. I feel unsafe as a black man touching people's cars with these, with these campaign cards, knowing that they have these Confederate flags on their tags. And so it really hit home. And, you know, I just happened to be this year in the right place at the right time to be able to cast my yes button. But understanding that there are people who came before me for decades, people who died trying to bring that flag down and it was really an, an emotional um, thing when when it finally happened because I recalled all of those events that had played over time that dealt with this with this symbol but you know our work cannot stop it at those markers. Nah, I, I remember um, when I called Nikki Haley's office that morning and the person that answered the phone when I told her you know I want to talk to the governor like, who am I? Uh, and I need the flag to come down. And she said, oh, that's not going to happen. And I was like, why not? She said, because it's always been there. And I think for many of us, we walk by symbols and statues all the time that have always been there. And until there's something that brings it to the forefront, like you, um, let me, and I, let me apologize for calling you Zakia, representative. No, it's fine. Zakia, Call me Z. You earn that, that <laughs> position. Um, you know, until something happens that makes you look at this thing differently, which is what is happening right there. There's a shift in consciousness right now in America where folks can no longer bury their heads in the sand about the inequities, about the injustice, and everyone now, it's on, it's on 24 hours a day that we're in this space. And these symbols aren't just heritage. It's not just a celebration of history. They're saying something when they wave that flag. And I think that that's what's really powerful. But it's getting a little inane. You know, there's been this movement to, you know, take down Columbus all over. Columbus, Ohio, they've taken down the Columbus statue. But are they going to change the name? You're in Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, they're taking down the statue. But what, are we going to change the name of these towns, Plantation, Florida? Like, where's the line going to be drawn? Just and that, that has actually been mentioned. You know, I, I spoke with a, a councilwoman last week after the city voted to remove the Andrew Jackson statue at City Hall. And she said some folks were even calling to change the name. And I'm like, okay, now, you know, are we going too far with this? And, you know, unfortunately, she received a lot of backlash for doing that. She said, you know, y'all took down our flag and now you're taking down the statue, um, you know, you can just forget about any, and this was from legislators, you can mm -hmm. forget about um, any state support coming to the city now. And, you know, so, 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 you know, we're, we're still dealing with that. And I say, you know, this, the, uh, Mr. Mr. Legg said that white supremacy is, is, is a false narrative. This, this thing, this thing called whiteness has existed for a long time and it didn't disappear when we took down the flag because for someone to have the uh, the kahunas to call a local city official and say well you know based on your decision and your vote you're not going to get this shows that it's more than just 
um, heritage and history. It's really about people's hearts and minds have to change in this thing. You can't legislate that. Let me ask you before we go to Mr. Legs, what was the vote in Mississippi? It wasn't unanimous. For the, for the flag? Yeah. The, um, in the House, it was, um, I, can't, I can't even recall the it number. Wasn't unanimous is the point it wasn't unanimous. It was not unanimous you, because, again, where we are in the legislative session, we had to first pass a resolution to, even, to be able to introduce the flag bill. So that was the biggest hurdle because we needed two-thirds votes in both houses. And so we were, and it came down to the day where we were like, we still need one more vote. We still need one more vote. And Saturday, we were able to get the resolution passed, which, you know, opened the door for the flag vote the next day. Um, and we had several Republicans that changed their vote from that Saturday to Sunday. So they voted against the resolution, but they ended up voting for the flag. And the argument that they made was because, you know, they promised their constituents that um, this needed to be a vote of the people and that the legislature shouldn't desi decide. And, you know, I, I answer that with, you know, the legislature decides everything else. We decide who, who gets health care and who doesn't. We decide what schools look like. We decide what communities look like. We decide the resources that our local uh, cities get. This is a statutory measure. Um, we need to make a decision, and 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 I and I would tell my deskmates, and I was pounding them every day, right? I was like, "What are you going to tell your kids and your grandpa and your grandkids after all of this is over? That you were on the right side of history, or you voted to continue, you know, this idea that you know people who look like me are less than or are or are inferior of you." What did um, they say? What I won one response? of them. I didn't win the other one, but. Um, you know, well, well, one of them just flat out said that he didn't even believe that systemic racism existed. Mm -hmm. And, and he felt that, and, and Mr. Legs can probably attest to this, that if we took down the flag, what's going to be next? You know, are we going to take this down? Are we going to take, you know, and, and because it was a, um, it was a vote of the people back in 2001, that we shouldn't take that right from them, that we should allow the, the people to vote on it. And so I think we came to a good compromise in that the design um, will be voted by the people in November, but it cannot contain a, a Confederate, contain the co Confederate battle emblem. Mr. Legs, um, as, as I'm listening to Representative Summers talk, you know, about the, the you know, folks holding on to this, you know, there are going to be people who will, will fly this flag, the Confederate flag, put out, you know, celebrate these monuments, these these traitors because they lost. They they you know it was an insurrection and they lost. Um, how do we deal with our neighbors, American citizens, who will, in defiance, fly a flag, which is basically saying that your life doesn't matter to them, because that's what that says. It does. I think everybody has the personal right to be able to to do whatever they want on their private property. But when it comes to public space, that's different. Part of this conversation and, and Representative Summers, I, I think articulated it beautifully when you said that we have to shift the, the consciousness or the, or the state of the minds of the citizens of Mississippi in order to achieve this. And this is what we are, are doing nationally. We need the continued shift of consciousness we need white America to share privilege. We understand that there is fear in the loss of heritage in the form of monuments or flags. But if we can shift that perspective to the real American history, what is real? It's the story of the sanitation workers march in Memphis, Tennessee where the civil rights movement evolved from political activism to economic justice. That is what we are still talking about today and still fighting for in this moment. What is real is that Madam C.J. Walker was the first person in her family born free in 1867 in Delta, Louisiana, and would become America's first self-made female millionaire would build a grand estate on the same street 
is Jay Goose Lindhurst and three miles from the Rockefeller estate. That is, yeah, that is the history that I don't want us to get, to get lost in these conversations. And I hope that we can have as much national attention on the urgency, the critical urgency needed to preserve African-American historic places. I think there is a backlash right now, right? And I feel it. I feel there's, you know, you're making me wear a mask. You're telling me I can't fly my flag. You're, you're infringing upon my rights as an American mm-hmm. citizen. Now you're taking down our heroes. What else do you people want? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that pushback historically always comes. Mm-hmm. And it usually doesn't end well or bode well for Black Americans in particular in this country. How do we stave that off? You know, every time there's gains after Reconstruction, some of the most horrific things happen mm-hmm. to black, black people in America. Uh, you know, during the Civil Rights Movement, you know, as America mm-hmm. watched water hoses and dogs and brutality, things changed and then it went left again. How do we sustain this? You know, I think given the activism of Black Lives Matter, given the political activism of Black politicians like Representative Summers, Le- Mayor LeVar Stoney in Richmond, the mayor of, of Burning, Birmingham, Mayor Woodfin. There are Black political leaders that are using their power and influence to reshape the cultural landscape of our nation. There are Black preservationists like myself. I believe that we are, are building the momentum to sustain this. But if we lead with a sense of empathy, because I have been sitting thinking about the difficulty, and this might sound odd to you and and to others, but can you imagine over generations being taught a false history and having that embedded in your DNA and in your family's pride, and then to realize once you are educated about the truth of that history, that it was a false construct, that it was used as a weapon to to glorify white supremacy. And so a lot of unlearning has to happen, and that's a difficult process. And I'm empathetic to Americans that are going through that. So I, I feel optimistic that the movement will be sustained and that we'll get to a space that will be more just. There was a statue in um, across the pond of a Black Lives Matter protester. It went up and in 24 hours it came down and it was replacing a very horrific person from the 18th century. And again, we're seeing people not have the appetite for sustained change, but I think you're absolutely right about the compassion. And and we're in this space, you know, where everything is so toxic Mm -hmm. already for this, but folks want change now, you know, Mm -hmm. representative Summers because the endurance of this space has been so long that it's we don't have that you know the capacity to wait any longer for people to catch up, and in our education system, which I don't know what that's going to look like in the next in the coming year, but that's where the real work needs to happen because that's where we get these things like Columbus discovered America and he was great and all of these other uh, lies actually happens in our school system. So there's a whole bunch of work we have to do. Uh, And I know that you guys, uh, we have to sum up because we have a whole lot of folks that want to ask a question. I know they're going to ask better questions than I have, those folks that are are watching, and let me just welcome them as well. But final words before we go to our our, uh, listeners, our watchers. We'll start with you, Representative Summers. Sure. So, um, you know, in all of the challenges that COVID has presented and the... um, the deaths and the murders even, right? Um, I think we've also been presented with some opportunities. And, you know, I can remember when the, the getting enough votes, whipping enough votes to, to bring down the flag looked bleak. And, and I was a little discouraged by it. And I had a conversation with my mom And she said, well, Zakia, you know, faith can move mountains. And I began to tell myself, encourage myself. Every day I woke up, I said, 
God, I'm believing in you. God, I'm trusting in you. God, you're moving. And I truly think that that is happening because what COVID has done is, you know, it's not so much about taking away your right to not wear a mask, right? As much as it is about caring for your fellow man, because when you're when you're when you're doing everything that the CDC uh, recommends that you're doing, you're not only keeping yourself safe and healthy, but you're also making sure that the person next to you is safe and healthy. And um, you know, my my desk mate even said before we left, and and we're still kind of in limbo in terms of when we're going to return back to session. But he said he says Akia, he said, would you be interested? and co-authoring with me a bill to erect a statue of Fannie Lou Hamer at the state capitol. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're beginning to see, I think, mm. you know, people are, are, are waking up and, and sure, Mr. Legs, you're absolutely right. It's kind of like, you know, being adopted and finding out that, you know, the persons that said that they were your mom and dad are actually not your mom and dad. It can, it can hurt you to the core. Mm -hmm. But I think that that also compels you to want to dig further and take action to find out who you are, you know, whose you are, and then what you can do to help somebody else. So I'm very optimistic about it. You know, we got to be optimistic, right? <laughs> In Mississippi, we got to be hopeful that, um, and, and in communities across this country, that we just got to keep our hands on the plow. Mm -hmm. Mr. Legs, are you optimistic? And what does sustained change look like? We've been talking about these symbols and monuments and statues, mm -hmm. which are symbolic. And as I look back, you know, it feels very symbolic as Representative Summer said in South Carolina in five years, not much has changed legislatively, tangibly. Are you optimistic? And what does change look like? Yeah, I'm optimistic. So monuments of justice that I celebrate and put my attention to. For example, today, we made a special announcement at the National Trust for Historic Preservation that we invested $1.6 million in 27 African American historic places across the United States. These monuments are sites, yeah, yeah. These are sites of resilience, activism, and Black excellence. And the viewers can go to savingplaces.org, check out the list. And I'm proud that just in two and a half years, we've invested in 65 preservation projects and funded $4.3 million. This is the future, and this is, this is what I think preservation justice looks like. So that's in Minneapolis. You have something in Minneapolis. You, you guys have been doing things. Today is a big day for you. Mr. It is a big day. Yeah, of course, in this this moment to spend time and space with you two, but we made a special grant to the city of Minneapolis in honor and memory of George Floyd, but also to uplift and bring greater recognition to the centuries of black history that has been overlooked in the city of Minneapolis. And what's unique about this special grant, not only will they document and identify African American historic sites in their community. It's also funding a community led vision and plan for the memorialization of their contemporary memorials related to George Floyd. So, this is innovative for preservation. It isn't just looking to the past, but it's looking to the present moment. I need to know why this is such a passion for you, you know. Yeah. First, you, you could have done a lot of things. Why, yeah. why are you so committed to this? You know, I feel like it's a calling. I graduated from the MBA program and I was searching for my professional identity. I thought I would wanted to make furniture at that point and went into the School of Architecture at the University of Kentucky. And this old white guy with his long beard, Dr. Dennis Domer, we had a random 15 minute conversation a couple of months later, I took a chance and I was working towards a grad degree in preservation. And thankfully they had me to conduct a statewide inventory of Rosenwald schools 
in my home state of Kentucky. And I learned that my mom and dad, aunts and uncles went to Rosenwald schools. And I also learned that Booker T. Washington in 1912, out of his beautiful mind, envisioned a massive school building program, partnered with philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, and together they would fund the construction of over 5,000 schools in 15 southern states. So for me, social movements is the heartbeat of preservation. It's partly what I'm passionate about, and it really was grounded in that Rosenwald School story that was in response to a crisis in Black education. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and wow. I, yeah, that's amazing. I know that there are people that are trying to get in here to, to ask questions. Actually, we have one person that's going to feel the questions and ask them of the panel. Let me thank you guys. Let me thank the folks that are, are watching as well. And let's bring in Mac to ask some questions. Hello, everybody. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that are being generated by your discussion, um, and I will share a few of them with you now, starting with uh, a question from Jill Strauss. She says she's happy that these symbols are coming down, but she worries that this will take up the space that the conversations and actions necessary to change systemic racism uh, would otherwise have occupied. I'd like to know what the speakers think about this. Representative Summers. Yeah, I, that's a great question. And, and I can definitely see her point. I do think that it um, does kind of shift the narrative to um, conversations um, that, that don't involve how we really create the systemic change that we want to see. You know, I think, I think it, it, it really is about what is your end game in all of this? You know, um, what is the outcome that you want to see by removing these these statues and these monuments is it about you know starting a conversation that can lead to public education around history and um, policy is is there a policy goal there is there um, some type of other advocacy means there so i i think it just kind of depends on you know what do you, what's the end game and you know i've been i've been we've been seeing this happening across the country you know where they topple down a monument um that infuriates a group of people i think it i think it also opens up dialogue about you know who that person was what they represented and like mr leg says ted begins to tell the real history of um what was happening during that time but there but there has to be a, a both and right so you 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 do that and then and then what you know now what so are you now going to be using this as a tactic to organize communities around a specific goal or um so i just i just i just wonder what is this leading to where is this leading us to if that makes you sense raise, you raise a great question in mississippi what is it leading to to take down that flag is there something tangible that will come from the removal of that flag in Mississippi? Well, I sure do hope so. I think if anything, it definitely gives us a new image. It uh, perhaps change, changes the perception of who Mississippi is now in 2020. And it shows that when um, you have a bipartisan effort of black and white folks working together towards something, um, something beautiful can happen as a result of that. And my hope is that this is just a start of um, more action to how can we work together to do some of the other things that we're calling for, like um, Medicaid expansion, like educational equity, like um, uh, expanding voting rights, and et cetera. So, you know, time will tell. Time will definitely tell, but um, I'm hopeful that, that we're at least moving the needle forward. Mr. Legs, is it taken away from the discussion around police reform, health care, all of the things that, that Re Representative Summers just brought up? You know, in many ways, I don't think it's taking away from the conversation. It's just revealing that there is a deep well of civic needs related to Black people. Like Representative Summers said it. We need education reform. We need police reform. You just expressed it. 
we need investment in this part of American history. There are so many different needs. What I think this moment is creating for us is an opportunity for our nation to make amends, for our opportunity for our nation to understand that our origin is rooted in racism and injustice, and that it is, is visible in all kinds of forms today. And people are talking more than they ever had across racial lines. People are writing and producing content more than they ever have. The national dialogue has shifted in a way, and if we sustain that, then I hope the end goal becomes reconciliation. Great answer, both of you. Mac? Yes, we have a question here from Denise Rohan Jones who asks, well, first she states that she, she agrees that these monuments and symbols of hate and racism should be removed, but she fears that the ugly part of history will be forever erased for future generations. How would you feel about placing these symbols of hate in museums as a reminder to not repeat racist mistakes of the past? Yeah. So, so we have a law on the, on the books that says that, you know, these statues and monuments can be moved, but they must be relocated in, in, a, in an appropriate area. Um, and so I think, you know, by, by relocating them into museums, you can, you can continue that conversation and that desire to want to learn about history. I don't think it takes, I don't think it takes away from that. Um, but, you know, something that Karen said early in the conversation was, you know, what will those things be replaced with? Um, and and if it's more monuments that you know are erected through a racial uh, equity lens um, or through a just lens, then I think that that's great. But if it's something else that doesn't help us, then you know we're kind of right back where we where we were. Or like history, history is ever changing. When those monuments mm -hmm. went up. The country had the appetite for those monuments and flags. Mm. 50 years from now, the new monuments might be offensive to that generation, whoever they mm -hmm. are. Muse Why not leave them up with the caveat or with the explanation that Pike was this person, Jackson was this person, this is why this is a complicated, with a, you know, and, and Lincoln is facing, uh, I want to say, I think it's Mary B McLeod Bethune or, or Ida B. Wells mm -hmm. facing each other in Washington, D.C., and that allows for there to be a juxtaposition for people to, to learn both and everything at the same time. That's actually part of the, the big problem is these pieces of art stand without information and contextualization. And so there's a, a misunderstanding uh, about that history. At the National Trust, our position, and this viewer asked a, a fantastic question. So relocation and erasure are two different things. And I don't think a lot of the conversation is about the erasure of this history because we need it to be visible in some form so that we never forget. And that's really the, the point of these monuments. I've been thinking about this idea where we link together humanities, arts, and preservation practice. If we can determine what the real intention was or the purpose for the erection of each of the 700 plus Confederate monuments on an individual basis. And for those that were erected for purposes of hate, that we as a nation make a decision to relocate them to a landscape so that they all share space, that our nation never invest in their preservation and maintenance, and that they decay like an hourglass over time, and that we are able to measure our social progress and racial inclusion based on their decay. And I think, our, I think as a nation, we need to start having big conversations at scale about how we are going to confront this issue. That's a powerful image. Mac. Such a beautiful way of saying it too, Mr. Legs. Thank you. A question from Jacqueline Brown. Um, First, she, mentioned, she mentions that the University of North Carolina recently named a building after the amazing Hunter alumna, Pauli Murray. Um, mm -hmm. And she mentions that to set up the question, what kind of shift of consciousness is required 
uh, specifically on college campuses to get more buildings named after black people. Um, and she notes that often this is done uh, as a result of philanthropy. How can we change uh, the structure of, of how these namings occur? Yeah, an another good question. So I didn't know about Paul and Mary until about four years ago. And we got involved with preserving Pauli Mary's childhood home in Durham, North Carolina. And come to find out Pauli Mary was a co-founder of the National Organization of Women, first African-American Episcopal Saint. Thurgood Marshall referred to her legal research as the Bible of civil rights law. Like she is an iconic social justice champion and hardly anyone knows about her story. I have seen academic institutions play a leadership role in the renaming of buildings to honor diverse Americans. I think as a starting point, if more universities look within their own history to be able to bring greater recognition to the Black experience on their campus, that's a starting point. And I think once we get to scale, then hopefully that will inspire some of the federal buildings for them to consider renaming some of these institutions. Hi, Mac. Um, let's see, okay. How about a question from the student perspective? Hardik Baskar asks the general question of how a student leader at, at Hunter College can start the conversation about Black America and the issues that Black America faces at Hunter College. That, I guess I'll take that one. Um, and, you know, as educators, folks that teach in the classroom, you know, I think it is incumbent upon, and I've always done this, even before we had a racial pandemic, you, 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 you're not just teaching a subject, you know, you're preparing students for life. And that requires, especially at Hunter, where our student body is so diverse, one of the most diverse student bodies in the whole entire country, to, to engage in a way that forces them to think critically about everything especially race. So, you know, as a student leader, you know, engaging in, in forums like this, having your own Zoom forums while we're in the Zoom era uh, to talk about what's actually on people's minds because the ignorance is what's gonna kill us, you know? So we have to start having these conversations more frequently. Do you guys agree? Yes, perfectly okay. said. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it, and it could just start with, um, you know, the, the girl that's on your hall, right? Or, you know, the friend that you see across campus. I can remember, and, and I'm a graduate of the University of Missouri, Columbia, um, where there was a 2% African-American um, uh, student body population. And I was the only black girl um, on my hall and one of two in my whole dorm and, you know, I would get all kind of crazy questions from folks. I don't know if they were more interested in me being from Mississippi or me being a black girl. But, um, you know, it, it, it opened up a dialogue and um, actually helped to create a relationship. And, you know, even with the co my colleagues that I have in the legislature, with my desk mates, you know, opening up that dialogue and sharing your perspective and your experience to issues that they may have not thought about in that way helps them to rethink, you know, what they thought was real or factual may actually be different. And the way that it lands or impacts people that don't look like them um, is definitely different. And then how do we begin to um, craft policies that, that affect or impact people um, that are, you know, more inclusive, and more just. So. And the only thing I'll add to that is, I would encourage the students to be curious. So we live in a multi three dimensional environment and question why does the historic built environment exist in the way that it does? Why do we have in many cities racially segregated neighborhoods? Like what is, what's the role of redlining and, and racial housing covenants? You know, there is a origin and a history to why our cities and our communities look the way that it does today. 
and that curiosity will help you find some answers. Yeah, you know, we, we heard as a response to um, the killings of black and brown people at the hands of law enforcement. Well, you know, we got black on black crime, you know, people, they killing each other, but it's like, you know, why? Ask the question, why is that happening? You know, why, why are black people killing black people? Why do their communities look the way that they look? Why do their schools feel the way that, that they feel? And when you can get to the root of that, then you can understand why that has been the, um, the outcome of those, how those systems um, interact. Mm -hmm. But to even get to those questions, you have to care. You know, yeah. when, people, when people say Black Lives Matter and your response is always all lives matter and you want to dismiss, you know, why that that phrase is even being uttered, you know, we, you know, we have to get to that first. Um, mm -hmm. but, Matt. I, I um, neglected to mention that that question was from the president of the student government, uh, Hardik Bhaskar. So thanks, Hardik, for that question. Um, and one more, if that's all right, before we go to breakout rooms, um, from Dave Bassnett. He asks, in the context of Black and Native historical intersections, how do you think indigenous preservation movements mirror and amplify the importance of Black preservation? Mm, good question. So I don't know that they mirror one another. In many ways, the, the resources are often different. With Native American heritage, it's cultural landscapes that are sublime and massive, that's rooted in a religious identity and, and, and historical narrative. And many African American historic places are modest, humble, vernacular architecture that has had a lot of change over time because of shifting uh, uh, populations, because of not having the economic capacity to maintain and, and, and kind of change that, that built environment. But the commonality between the two histories is the erasure of our history, the invisibility of our history, the loss of cultural heritage, and the continued fight to ensure that this history is, is considered part of the origin story of our nation. And if we get to the point that it's not just an origin story of whiteness, that it's an origin story related to Native American history and African American history, then I think that will be uh, something that we can measure progress by. Paul's baked into that question though, is this notion, I'm, I'm hearing this a lot, you know, can we just spend time fixing the anti-blackness and before we you know yes of course the native americans have a story and there are so many groups you know they like to lump in black and brown when we talk about affirmative action it doesn't really specifically talk about black people even though really? that in institution was created for specifically black people and i think now you know uh representative summers talked about black on black crime and all of the issues that are germane to us, COVID-19 disproportionately impacts Black people, of course, Native Americans as well. But mm -hmm. if, if we can't focus, and I feel like we're yeah. everywhere, you know, trying to solve all of the world's problems in, in one fell swoop, that maybe we won't see the progress that we need to see. Let's fix this. I agree with that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we're having a breakout, we're having a bunch of breakout sessions, Mac. Is it gonna be more than one? There are a handful, yes. Um, Misha Smith will come on and I think uh, welcome everybody to move on to the, the discussion breakout rooms. Um, but I believe is it, the way it works is you log off of this and you should have, you will have, uh, you should have registered for a breakout room and received a link uh, in your inboxes. Well, let me thank our panel and let me thank President mm -hmm. Rob actually uh, first and Roosevelt House for hosting this. Speaking of justice, race, racism, and reform, down with symbols and monuments, that was tonight. And let me thank, of course, Mr. Bre Brett Leg. Bre Brett Legs, you, you got me caught up with the leg story <laughs> before we got on here, so um, it's in my head. Brett Legs, who's the executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, 
Uh, and of course, they are doing some great work. So go check out everything that they're doing. Uh, give the website again, please, Brett. Savingplaces.org. Savingplaces.org. And Representative Zakia Summers, Junior, you're a freshman, but you're doing so much in the state of Mississippi. Chakwe Lamumba, you have a great, I, I love Jackson as uh, and Jackson State and Jersey. We went to elementary school together. Did you? <laughs> and the NAACP president is also from Mississippi. So y'all yes. are doing some amazing things there. And I uh, thank you for being here today as well. Thank you so much. Thank so you. Honor. That's great. All right. Nisha is coming yes. in.